Your Pastor Wilson. Thank you, Pastor Wilson, for joining us. Hello, and how are you? Please let me know that you can hear me and let me know where you're watching us from this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pastor Wilson, for letting me know that you can hear me well and clearly. Thank you very much. I'm going to start off in a short while, just waiting for a few guys to join. Where are you people? I'm waiting for you to join so that we can start. Please let me know that you can hear me clearly. Let me know where you're watching us from. And I will be, will be starting in a short while. In a short while. In a short while. Invite your friends, please. We are started a little bit late today, but it is well. It is well. Create a watch party for me if you don't mind. Invite your friends to watch with you. And uh, we will start in a short time. 
I love that song. I love that song by Ezekiel Israel. All right, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am your host, Pastor Steve Kigwa, and today is uh, just the day before Father's Day, which is celebrated worldwide tomorrow. And I have a word for somebody who is a father, who has a father, who wish to become a father. And I'm sure we are going to be blessed together. I'm waiting for some few guys to join and then we can start. I think I am ready. I am ready. This music you're hearing on the background is courtesy of Rob G Gospel Channel. Music you can listen to and believe in. have to start somehow. I want to begin right there. I don't want to wait here. I think I want to release this thing that is in my heart today. And let you go into other business of the day. Please allow me to pray as we begin today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak your word. And I just present and heal myself as a tool in your hand. Use me for your own glory. Anoint me today that somebody will hear my voice. Be blessed and be instructed and be taught the right way of relating with the Father. And I pray that, Lord, wisdom will be revealed. Anoint me. Anoint my lips. Bless the listeners, those that are watching right now and those that will listen even afterwards. May your presence be with us today. Open our minds to understand, to receive counsel from your word. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. You can say amen and you can type amen for me. Great. Thank you that um, you, took, you took the time today to join us for today's uh, broadcast. It's a weekly broadcast we, we run every week on Saturday from 3. Today we are starting a little late, 3.30. Sorry for starting a little late, but it's in order. Everything is fine. Today is a special day. Why is it special? It's special because, like I said when I began, that um, tomorrow is Father's Day. And... Uh, I want to speak, I promise something that I want to fulfill today. I want to honor the promise that I made if you are listening to me that day. The day before Mother's Day, I spoke on the mothers. And I do remember telling you that I was speaking about the mother as though I did not know anything about the father. I promised you at that time that one day I would speak about the father just before Father's Day. And... I thank God that that day is today that I want to speak to you about the Father. And uh, if you have been following me closely for the last couple of weeks, you know that I have been referencing a scripture that we find in the book of Luke chapter 15, which is going to be our text for today. It's a text we have been looking at for the last couple of weeks, I think for the last four weeks or so. And we began by talking about, uh, it's a story Jesus gave. Just to remind you what it is about, is a story about um, is, is a story about a, uh, a man. Jesus gave this story, and it is a parable. 
He said that that I want us to examine today, he was giving us a story about a man who had two sons. A man who had two sons. The story you find in the book of Luke chapter 15. And we have been talking about uh, the feet, the, the characters in the stories that are in the story that have been featured. We've been talking about that. And I think the first two weekends when we started this series, I spoke on the younger son. Talk about I spoke about the younger son. And we learned quite a bit about the younger son. Last weekend, I spoke on the the older son. And we were talking about how he was resentful. And how he refused to get into the dance floor to celebrate his brother who had come back home. And I spoke to you and I mentioned to you that not everybody will celebrate you. Some people would rather see you perish. Some people will be happier if you stayed away. Some people would be happier if God never showed you any mercy. And I don't want to go into that. I think uh, I just wanted to remind you what we spoke on last week. But it is important for you to understand that not everybody celebrates you. There are some people who feel bad when they see God being gracious, merciful, and loving towards you. They would rather be, they would rather see you being punished. They would rather see you out there suffering. They are happy when you're suffering. They don't want you to come back to the same level and enjoy the same privileges such as they do. They would rather they enjoy themselves. And we spoke a lot about that and we said, these elder brothers are actually in the churches today. They are in the churches today. They are resentful. They don't mind you staying down. They have a problem the moment you start getting blessed. Now they have a problem. They become angry and they resentful towards you. And we spoke a lot about that. And I also talked to you on how you deal with resentment. And I said, until you deal with resentment, you'll never be able to step, to step into your greatness, into the blessings that God has for you. You have to kill resentment before it kills you. It will shorten your life. And I don't want to go into details about that. I almost am going into that direction. I don't want to do that. Now, today, I want us to go into the next thing that I promised that I would do. And this, the thing I want to talk to you about today is about the Father. Because in this story, Jesus brought this story to us. Go with me. And I just want to show you. I'll be reading several other verses, but for now, I just want to be, I'll pick up on a few. Uh, Jesus said this story. Jesus said in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15, he said, and he said, a certain man had two sons, had two sons, a certain man. In fact, I want to say to you today that this story is actually not even about the elder son. It's not even about the younger son. Although we have really talked about the younger son, not just myself, but many people, many preachers and teachers and evangelists, pastors preaching on these stories. They speak a lot about the prodigal. In fact, it is called the parable of the prodigal son. Forgive me if I differ with bet to differ with that kind of opinion the story according to me and where i see i sit today this story is not even about the sons it is not about the younger son the prodigal son who took away who took off from home and decided to go away to a far country the story is not even about his elder brother who felt bad when he came back and he was celebrated the story is about the father the story is about the father is the main subject of the story, but Jesus had put in some other characters into the story to depict for us the truth that he wanted us to understand from this text, from this scripture. The story is about a certain man. He is the man that Jesus is about to us in this story. So, but we get too engrossed in the other characters that we forget the pain that Jesus went through trying to paint in our minds the story about this man who is a father of two sons. And I dare say that this story Jesus was talking about, he was trying to show the love of his father, the heavenly father. So the story is about the father. It begins with the father. It also ends with the father. The year, the year son, after he had gone away for years, and he came back, we don't know how long anyway, but he came back, he had squatted all he had with, uh, with, with prostitutes and all that, like we saw in the story. He comes back. And in the Bible, in the, in the book of Luke chapter 15, if you look at verse, verse 17, 
Um, look at verse 20. Uh, verse 19. And uh, let me see, start from verse 18. He said, this younger son talking. He said, I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against him and before you. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. He came to his father. But he was, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I want you to notice that. His father saw him and had compassion and he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son began to talk to his father what he had recited. He had rehearsed something. And this is what he said. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, and put on his head and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened cow and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Verse 24. For this son of was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he had and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother. Is come back the fattened calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father. Please note that out. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, oh, These many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never givest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thou with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fattened calf. Verse 31, And he said unto him, Son, thou art with me, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost. And he is found. Trust the scripture. This younger brother would never have been received home were it not for the voice of his father. It is the father's voice that deterred him. It is the father's voice that spoke on his behalf. And I love the father because the father spoke when he saw the son. He saw the son. He ran towards him. He kissed him. And he welcomed him home. He spoke to the servant. He said, bring the best robe. The voice of a father is making someone being clothed. And that's why my message today is titled, Made by the Father's Voice. He said, bring the best robe. And a man that was naked, was wearing tattered clothing, was robed and clothed and was warmed up again because of the voice of the father. And the father said, bring him sandals and let him, let him put them on. And the father said, bring him a ring and put it on his finger. And this man who was staying in the field with a swine who had downgraded himself was raised back up again to a royal position because of the voice of his father. And even when this older brother was angry and resentful towards him, I love the father. The Bible says that the father went outside. I love God because the story about the, this father is actually the story about our God. And God has a way of coming right to where you are. Right where you are, even if you are outside the house, God will come right to where you are outside the house. The Bible says, according to the that the father went to where his elder son was and he spoke to him. This son's healing on his resentment and the bitterness that he had toward his younger brother was going to be eased off and ooze out from his life because of the voice of his father. It is the voice of the 
father between the elder brother and the younger son. It was because of the voice of his father that restored somebody that was lost. Someone that was dead is will come back home because of the voice of the father. This voice is the voice of our God. And the father here is depicting God as a compassionate God, as a loving God, forgiving, who keeps no record of wrongs. And I want to tell you today, if you're watching, doesn't matter where you're watching, whether it's morning, evening, or night, wherever you are, whatever it is that you have done, when you come back to God, he will receive you with the same love because his love does not diminish because you took off, you went away, you decided to do things he never asked you to do. Even though you did things contrary to his expectation and what he wanted and wanted and, 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 and wanted for you, he will still receive you. And this is the kind of God that we have, the kind of Father that we, we serve. He is so merciful and so compassionate. Were it not for the voice of our Father in heaven, were it not for his compassion, some of us would not even be speaking today. But because of his love and mercy that received us, when we went too far away, he came right to where we were. He welcomed us, received us, clothed us, warmed up us again with his love, put on, gave us sandals to put on, and gave us the authority of royalty with a ring, and called us sons, and called Jesus our elder brother. And today we can speak with confidence. Not because we didn't do things wrong, but because we have received compassion from a loving father. We have been made by the voice of our Father in heaven. But allow me today not to talk about the Father in heaven. I want to talk about the earthly Father. I want to talk about the earthly Father today. And I want to take an IQ from there. The story about Father. Now, tomorrow we are celebrating fathers. And I, by the way, I want to celebrate all the fathers today. Thank you, my brother R R B, for joining us today, and I'm also thank you for joining us. Tomorrow we are celebrating fathers, and I want to celebrate many fathers in advance, even before the days come. I want to celebrate fathers because I am one of those fathers. I am one of the fathers. We are not celebrated a lot. In fact, it is unfortunate that the society does not celebrate fathers. And it is, we are, society generally does not celebrate fathers at all. And uh, I don't know why that be the case. And whatever the reason may be, I don't think it justifies the fact that uh, even though we have had some cases of some men who have misbehaved as fathers, we still have some wonderful fathers today who are alive. Even the fathers who raised us and the fathers that we are raising the generation that is to follow after us. There are fathers, there are men out there who are doing a commendable job. And I want to salute all my brothers, wherever you are watching us from. I want to salute all my, all my brothers who are fathers out there and those aspiring to become fathers. I want to salute the fathers for the great job that you do. I know no one may know that you cry sometimes. You're worried, sick about where you get money take your children to school, or even to put food on the table. I know you struggle sometimes without knowing whether where the next meal is going to come from, but you, you try to put on a brave face, and you sometimes, sometimes you try to pretend as if you are just but a bulwark of strength, but deep down on the inside, you know that you, you, you are just like anyone else. But I want to salute you for the effort, for the strength, for studying by your children, raising your children amidst troubles and challenges and difficult times and hardship and all kinds of allurement there are in the urban cities and wherever you're watching us from i want to salute all men who are fathers who are doing a lot with the little resources that they have a little salary you don't even know how you will take your children to the university but somehow by god's grace you do it i want to salute you because it is not how many cars that you drive it is not the the size of the mansion that you live in that determines it measures your greatness as a father. It is the kind of children that you raise. It's how your children will describe you when they talk to their friends. That really is the real measure of how great you are as a man. I don't care if you ride a bicycle or ride a motorcycle or drive a Mercedes or do whatever it is that you do. It's all right to do all these things. But I want to salute fathers who are involved, who are not negligent, who are involved. They are involved in their children's lives.
They save their lives. They prophesy over their lives. They pray over their lives. They guide their children. They, they give them counsel. I want to celebrate those fathers because these are the fathers who have made the society the way it is today. And today, by the way, I will speak about fathers as if I do not know anything about mothers. I say don't mind. I was speaking about mothers as if there was nothing I know about fathers. So today, I'm talking about fathers as if I do not know anything at all about mothers. Now let me say this to you. Thank you, Robert Julius, for joining us. Let me say this to you, that fathers are important too. Fathers are important too. And they are so key in the lives of children, but their importance in the lives of children, both boys and girls, are different from the mothers. Just like mothers are important to the lives of their children, fathers are important, but they are important in a different way, in a different dimension. They are not, we are important, but not like the mothers. Mothers are important, but they are not important like in the dimension in which fathers are important to the children. And I'll be proving to you this from a scriptural perspective, from a psychological perspective, and even from general wisdom perspective. I'll prove it to you to show you how much important fathers are. But before I do that, I want to give you a story that I read many years back. And I wrote it in one of my books. Maybe you can grab it one of these days and read the story. It's narrated nicely. I want to just give you the tips, uh, the bits and tips of the, of the story. And the story is about something that happened in Northwest South Africa in a national park. Uh, if I remember the name correctly of that national park in South Africa, Northwest South Africa, I think it's called something like Pilantzburg or something like that. About 25 years ago, there was a behavior that was noticed in, the, in that national park uh, amidst the, a family of, la, of, of elephants. Elephants. The elephants, those, thank you, Victoria, for joining us today. The, the game rangers notice about 25 years ago, it's something that is documented. You can go into the archives and find it. I read it in the libraries myself. So it's something in the public domain, but I put it in my book as well to, to illustrate a point. And so the story, this story is about elephants in north, northwest South Africa in a national park there where the male bulls of elephants, young ones, were becoming aggressive and they would attack from nothing, from no provocation at all. They would attack even the other herbivores. They would attack buffaloes. They would attack rhinos. Without any provocation, they would attack them. They would then they would kneel down and gore them to death. And that is not a behavior that is characteristic of elephants. So it was a concern in that national park. And there were some researchers who decided to do some bit of investigation and research to try and establish why that was the case. Why the aggressive behavior of these young male elephants against their fellow herbivores. And they discovered that prior to that behavior was noticed, some years back, about 10 or so years back, that means we are talking about almost 35 years ago, they, they discovered that there was an order that had been issued out in that, in that national park to try and manage or to manage the population of, of, of elephants in that national park. And what the game rangers did at that time, because the population of elephants was so high and the habitat was not, of course, it wasn't growing in terms of size and in terms of generating, you know, whatever the animals were feeding on. So they decided they wanted to eliminate the, the old male elephants. So they killed the old male elephants. So the young bulls grew up in an environment where they did not see the mature elder males that were sort of supposed to be the role models to moderate or to temperate the young bulls. So the young bulls of these elephants, when they were young, they grew up in an environment where they did not notice, they did not see the male, the male uh, adults, the way they were behaving. So they became very aggressive. Well, I know there is no way we can compare and benchmark human beings with, elef uh, with elephants or any other animal for that matter. But there's a point I want to illustrate. The reason why these young bulls were aggressive was because of the absence of the adult males. And this is something that you will also notice in our society today. 
where the fathers are negligent or not involved at all, the children who are raised, especially the boy child, they do not know how to behave as a male or to become a male because they don't have a male role model over their lives. So they tend to, to get into a lot of weird things because the father figure is not in their lives. And that's why I began by saying that fathers are important, but they are important in a different way. It has been proven, and this is something I also want you to check out. Go and do, read on research and you find out this is the case. It has also been found out that children at the ages of six weeks when they are born, at the age of six weeks are able to identify their father's voice. If the father is involved in the first place, that is. At the age of six weeks when a child is born, both boys and girls, they are able to identify and recognize their father's voice. By the time they develop to about eight weeks, that's about two months, children at the age of two months, three months thereabout, they can even tell the, the baby, the, the, they, they can tell the difference between how the father and the mother takes care of them. They can see there's a difference between the father and there's a difference between them. Even when they are asleep, they can sense, they can tell, that's the father changing me. That's the father turning me. That's the mother saying this or, or doing that. They can tell that. And it is very interesting that even children, as they continue to grow, by the time children be, begin to learn how to speak, the first word they learn is the word of their father, or to say daddy or baba or whatever they call father in their language, whether it's English or native language. The first word mostly they learn is the father's name whatever they call it. Now, it hasn't yet been known why that is the case yet. It, nobody has really come up with the proper research to document exactly why is that the case. And by the way, personally, I've experienced that as well. My children learn to call my name before they learn to call their mother's name. And the mother was like, how come I'm the one breastfeeding this child? No one knows why the children learn how to call out their father before they call out their mother. Most of the children. Now, Children, even when they are toddlers, have, a got, have got an innate father need. They keep asking about their father. They want to hear his voice. They are fascinated by the voice of his father. When he speaks to them on phone, they will be engrossed by the voice of their father. They, when he's not in the house, they will ask their mother where their father is. They will ask, they will ask the mother what time he's coming, where he went. They are fascinated just by the father to be with them. So we are important. Sometimes it's only that we have not been able to realize how important we are to young children. And the need for fathers is not just for young children. As children grow from being infants to toddlers and they go into young and to, into teenage, their need for their father does not diminish. In fact, it is magnified but it becomes more complex. For instance, young girls at the age of uh, from teenagehood, from 13 onwards to the time they get or they leave the home, the way they relate with their father is like they are rehearsing their marriage with their father. The way a girl relates with, his fa with her father is like a marriage rehearsal of how she will behave when she finally gets married. In fact, the father for a girl is the standard by which all other men will be weighed, will be measured by the way the father relates, talks, behaves, models for the girl. So you can see how important the father is. The father is so important to the girl. Not just to the girl, but to the boy as well. In fact, to the boy it is even critical. The father is so much important to the boy more than the father. And before I tell you how important the boy, the father is to the boy, allow me to mention to you that when families break up, the biggest losers in a home are the boy children because children are given to their mothers. Girls will be okay with their mothers because the mother is their role model. They are girls and they are being raised by a woman. So they will learn, they will continue to learn being a woman. But when family breakups, boys suffer more from that breakup than girls, than even the parents themselves. Even when their mothers remarry, still the gap for the father need is still there. They still crave for their father. It's, in fact, it is worsened when even the mother marries. Because now the boy goes to another man who is not a father. If he is not a good man, then the boy is really lost. 
And that's why I also want to salute the fathers who are raising children that they did not father, but they have accepted them, adopted them as their own children. They have done everything they do as if these children were their own children. I want to salute you guys who are taking care of children that you did not father. You are great men. And if no one told you anything, may the Lord bless you for the work that you do. Now, let me tell you how important a father is to the life of a boy. For the life of a boy, a father to a boy is actually a guide. A boy is looking up to the father. If you stand in front of a mirror, you and your boy, when you look at your reflections on the mirror, the boy looks at the image of the father and he sees what he will become. The boy looks at, this is how I will become. The father looks at the image of the boy and sees where he was. And the difference is only time. So the father is a role model for the boy. And without the father, the boys are lost completely. That's why if you're a single mother and you're listening to my sermon today and you don't have a father for uh, uh, the father for the boy is not living with you. You need to look for a father figure. It could be your aunt, uh, the uncle to the boy or you, one of the people in the society, someone respectable and someone who loves God and who has got good values and good virtues. It is a liability for a boy to be without a father. It's a liability. It might be difficult for some fathers and even some mothers not to have a son, but it is much difficult for a boy to be without a father. The boy, when he becomes a teenager, even though he needs the father, he needs the father in such a way that he wants to see how he can challenge the ideology and the philosophy that the father has. That's why you find boys at teenage who they try to test their father. They try to do contrary to what the father expects, just to try and they can gain with their father just to see whether the father can react and how he reacts and, and all that. They will try to challenge his ideology and his philosophy. And it is a complex relationship. And as they continue to grow, they begin to think that their father doesn't even so, know so much. They begin to equate themselves at the same level. In fact, they begin to think they know more than their father. That now they think they can advise the father. But by the time they hit 20, they do great. When they go to the university, they are done with their courses. And finally, they get into the world of work. And they settle down. And they start a family. And they do what the Bible says. That a father shall leave his mother. A man shall leave his father and mother to go and begin his own color. By the time they get there, when they start their own family, all of a sudden they realize, oh my goodness me, this world is a different world. For sure, my father knew something that I do not know. And all of a sudden, they want to go and consult with their father because now they realize it's a different world again. These are enchanted waters. They now, the father they were despising that was not important so much at that time. Now they realize they need his counsel. They need his wisdom. They need to hear his opinion. I do remember my father, who passed away about nine or so years ago, even when I was as married as I am, when I had issues, I would go to him and say, hey, dad, hey, things are like this. And I remember one day, I remember one advice my father gave me. I, have, I will never forget. And he would sit down and listen to me and listen and I would talk to him. And one day, this is something, he told me many things, but one of the things that he told me that really I remember clearly, he said to me, son, you've got to do what you are supposed to do. Doesn't matter what is happening. You've got to do what you are supposed to do. If you're supposed to feed your family, feed them. Whatever you're supposed to do, buying food for them, buy. Whatever you are supposed to do as a father, as a man, do it. There are other things will fall into place. And if they don't fall into place, you will have done what you're supposed to do. So all of a sudden, when the son now becomes a father himself, now he realizes that his father has got something that he can share with them. And by the way, many people, both ladies and men, never come to realize how important a father is. And many families despise their father. Like what the Bible talks about, that there is a generation that despises their father. And we are living in times when men and women despise their fathers. They don't have any regard for their fathers. Sometimes people never realize how important a father is until the day that father that they consider to be a good for nothing man. They don't realize how important that father was until the day they die. And the covering is not there. 
there because you don't realize that the father is the man or the person that God has ordained to give registry of entry into the earth. And that is why children are named after their father. Even in the Bible record, you see that so and so, son of so and so, so and so, son of children named after the father and the fathers provide the end the registry of entry into the earth and the second thing that they, the father does for the children especially for the boy child but for the children anyway both boys and girls is to give them identity identity some form of identification that you belong to this family you belong to this clan it's the father who gives the identity of 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 of, of a family of a clan and it is very important for you to understand that and sometimes it is until when the father dies now you are left without the person who gave you registry of entry into the earth and who has given you a place of identi identification all of a sudden things begin to get a bit different and you will notice someone who was never bothering and a neighbor who was never bothered at all when the man was alive but when the man dies all of a sudden he wants to come and say the borderline between the plot of the two plots where the widow is left now and his plot they start saying now you are encroaching and they start fighting but when the man was alive they wouldn't dare do that Sometimes it's unfortunate that men die as fathers without being appreciated, without knowing that they did a good job. They may have made a mistake, but who doesn't make mistakes anyway? They may have done mistakes, but they die and people don't appreciate them. It's only when they are dead that now people begin to talk about how great their father was. How about if you went today or tomorrow and look for your father and sat down with him if you can, and if you cannot, give him a call and let him know how great a father he is. Is. I wouldn't be where I am today were it not for my father. It was be it's because of my father. Not so much by what he did for me. Not so much by what uh, he did in terms of giving me stuff. My father did not give me any shiny cars. He never left me any plot or anything like that. But he gave me a heritage and values. He showed me how to be determined. He showed me to make, how to learn to be a man of character. How to pursue uh, with what you do with diligence. My father taught us how to work with our hands. To provide for ourselves. To earn an honest living without stealing. Or, or doing all kinds of things that people do. And I thank God for my father. Were it not for my father, I would not be here today, I can guarantee you. Were it not for my It was his counsel. It was his prayers. It was the prayers he said in secret that I didn't even hear. I was lucky to have known one time something strange, miraculous happened in my life one time. And they narrated to me how my father was praying about me, for me, about that, about my life when I was in high school. And it was the prayer of a man or called a father that really can take you far. Today, I want to show you how important the voice of a father is. And there are many things we can talk about fathers today because I, I wish I had the time to talk to you about the love of a father and talk to you about the touch of a father. But today, I just want to talk to you about the, the voice, the voice of the father. We are made by the voice of our father. The father is the first spiritual covering over his children. And it is the father who prophetically prophesies and declares and make decrees over his children who secures their destiny and chart them on the right course and like arrows being shot to a destination to an aim to and that is what fathers do fathers do great work unfortunately the society we live in today does not celebrate fathers at all they despise father you don't need to go far after i'm done with you on this broadcast i just want you to turn on your radio or your television and you will see that even the dramatizations and the episode that you see on television you do not see any dramas or operas or or any any, any kind of acting or programs that depict a man as a loving responsible husband and father they depict men as womanizers as weaklings as weak men so people are made to believe that men are like that but that is not true. That's a lie from the devil. Because there are men who are responsible, men who are truthful, men who are honest, men who are raising their children, praying over their children, standing on the gap for their children, doing everything, they fighting the devils for their children. There are men fighting, telling the devil, you have fought me on this thing, but you cannot fight my children anymore. There are men who are responsible, but the media... The media has propagated an ideology of men who are not responsible, who cannot be trusted. That is not the truth. Well, there are those characters, yes, but that is not the aggregate of the truth. 
it must it's a misinformation it, it, it's a misnomer it's it's a lie to try to depict men as weak when we have got strong men who are doing wonderful things raising their families there are men who have sacrificed careers because of their children. There are men who have sacrificed many things. Of course, I know there are those who sacrifice their families in the out of their career in pursuit of money and business. But I'm talking about the men that do wonderful things that have real fathers. Those are the men that I'm talking about. And most likely, your father is one of those men. And perhaps you are the way you are today because of your father who stood with you. He withstood when you, be, when you became unruly and became rowdy, when you could not listen to anything. He stood you when you went well. It is your father who brought you back, embraced you, received you. you and it doesn't matter whether it's the biological father or the spiritual father. Some of us are the way we are, even though we went wayward, because our fathers received us home, clothed us with a robe, gave us sandals to put on, and Pooh gave us rings, and we were identified again as men who are growing to become fathers. Fathers are important. They are so important. And we cannot or underestimate the importance of a father. Now, I don't want to labor so much. Let me go into my right assignment for today. Let me just go straight on into what I want to talk to you about today. That was just an introduction. I think I got carried along so much by my introduction. Let me go into my proper assignment for today. Talking about made by the voice of my, by my father's voice. Now, I have been looking at the scriptures and there's something that really has amazed me for many years. And it's only about five years ago that God began to teach me on something, uh, on this thing. And this is what I want to talk to you about. I won't take long. In fact, I, will not take, I hope I won't take more than 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes. Let, let me see if I can do that. We all know, and before I do that, please allow me to read for you a scripture. Let me read for you a scripture in the book of Proverbs. Go with me if you are reading, if you have your Bible with me with you. Please go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 17. I want to read one verse for you. One verse for you. One verse for you. And I'll, and I'll get into what I want to talk to you about. The book of Proverbs chapter 17 verse 6. Now listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children are their fathers. Now that's what I'm interested in. That the glory of children are their fathers. The glory of children are their fathers. The glory of the, of the children, of children are their fathers. Now, for many years, like I was telling you, for many years, I used to wonder why and how come that a man by the name called Solomon, who is accredited as one of the most wisest men that ever lived, the wise Solomon, in fact, he's a proverbial thing in the entire world. The wise Solomon, we call him. I have always wondered, for many years I used to wonder, how come that Solomon was able to identify the one thing that made him uh, get more than what he asked for when God visited him at night in a dream. We read in the Bible, in the book of First Kings, I believe we read that one day God visited Solomon in the middle of the night in a dream and he said to him Solomon of course you know Solomon was a son of David by Bathsheba the wife the former wife of Uriah whom David killed you remember that now Solomon the Bible talks about God took visited him at night in a dream and he said to him Solomon tell me what it is that I can do for you and it was a dream as recorded in the Bible. But the Bible says that Solomon told God in the dream that give me wisdom to be able to govern your people. Give me wisdom. Now, I, this is the point. This is where I'm going with this story. I have always wondered where Solomon had learned the wisdom to know what to ask for. Because the Bible says, God told him, because you have asked for wisdom and you didn't ask for wealth. And you did not ask me to deal with your enemies. But because you have asked for wisdom to rule my people wisely, then I will give you the wisdom, but I will also give you these other things that you did not ask. I will give you the wealth, and I will give you, I will, I, I, will, I will defeat your enemies. You will be at peace. And during Solomon's time, there were not so many battles. In fact, there was quiet and peace in the land. 
And Solomon never even prayed for that. Now, I have always wondered, what is the wisdom that Solomon had that made him to know what to ask for? Because if he did not have the wisdom, he wouldn't have asked for wisdom. He must have the wisdom first to know how to ask for wisdom and not to ask for fame or wealth or those other things that we may want. He he would have asked for, for, for the extension of the kingdom. He would have asked for many things, but he didn't ask to see. He only asked for wisdom now the question is how did he get the wisdom where did that wisdom come from for him to know that he needed to ask for wisdom and not to ask for wealth and not to ask for power not to ask for extension of his kingdom not to ask for the defeat of his enemies where did he get that wisdom from where did he get that wisdom from that's the big question that i'm i have been asking and god began to speak to me about five seven years ago and showed me exactly where solomon got the wisdom to know where what to ask for not to ask for where if it was a man they would have said give me money give me well give me big cars give me a big house i'm not saying if there's anything wrong with that no but we would have said but we would have missed out on the bigger picture Solomon got these things that he never even asked for. There are some prayers you can make to God that makes God give you things that you didn't even ask for. Even though God has said, ask and you shall receive. There are some things when God visits you, when he asks you, when he gives you an opportunity to ask from him what you want. There are some things you can ask from God that makes him to give you more than what you ask for. According to Ephesians 3.23, that he will do abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above what we think or even ask. Now this is exactly what happened to Solomon. Now I began to read my Bible. That's why I find the Bible fascinating and interesting. Because if you ask the Bible questions, it begins to answer itself. So I began to look into my Bible because I wanted to find out the answer to the question I've just stated. Where did Solomon get the wisdom from to know what he needed to ask, not to ask for where? Where did he get it? And I found it in the Bible. And I will show you today. I want you to go to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. And I just want to read a couple of verses there. Very fast. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Very fast, very fast. This is what my Bible says. Proverbs chapter 4. Let me read from a version that does not talk about thy, thou, and all that. Okay. This is what my Bible says. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Going downward. You can write it down. You can read later. Now, listen. Now, the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, the son to David. The Solomon I'm talking about. He's the one who wrote the book of Proverbs. He also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, listen to what Solomon says. He says in verse 1, Proverbs 4, Listen, children, to a father's instruction. He is a father now. So he is giving instruction. And this is what he's saying. Listen, children, to a father's instruction. And pay attention so that you may gain discernment. Number two, verse number two says, because I give you good instruction, do not forsake my teaching. Verse three, it says, when I was a son, now listen to the instruction and the counsel that Solomon is giving. He gives the instruction and the counsel that he is referring to when he was a son, when he was a boy in his father's house. Verse three, this is what he says, when I was a son to my father. He is giving us counsel and instruction that he received when he was young, when he was a son. When I was a son to my father, a tender, only child before my mother. Now for sure you know that he was the only child at that time. Because the first, the firstborn that was, the, 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 the baby that Bathsheba gave birth to died. So when Solomon was being born, there was no other child from the same mother at that time. So he was the only child from his mother. This is what the Bible says. He says, he taught me, he referring to his mother, he, his father, he says, verse 4, he taught me and he said to me, he is telling us what his father told him. He is telling us what the voice of his father spoke over into his life, what his father said to him. This is what Solomon is telling us, what the voice of his own father, and I'm not talking about heavenly father, I'm talking about the earthly father, David, this is what David told Solomon. He says, let your heart lay hold of my words. Let your heart lay hold of my words. Keep my command so that you will live. Verse 5 says, acquire wisdom. This is David speaking to Solomon. He said to him, acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. No, no, no. I want to change that version. I want to read you another, another version that states better the way I want, to, I want it to sound. I want to read from King James, the New King James Version, that verse. The Bible says in the King James Version, verse 5, it says, Get wisdom. In all you are getting, get understanding. This is David who was speaking today to Solomon. Forget, forget, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. 
Forsake her not. Forsake her not, referring to wisdom. Let me go back to verse 5 again. Get wisdom. And in all you are getting, get understanding. His father had taught Solomon that the most important thing to get in life is wisdom. It's understanding. He is telling us what his father was instructing him when he was a son, when he was a boy at his father's house. The father was telling him that in all you are getting, get understanding. Get wisdom. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of her mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, referring to wisdom, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, verse, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. You can read the rest of the scriptures for yourself. I'll stop right there in verse 7. Chapter 4, Proverbs, uh, and, and verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing, David told Solomon. Therefore, get wisdom. And we thought by getting, get understanding. Now you can see that Solomon knew and understood what to ask for when God visited him at night through a dream. He had learned what to ask for from his own father. He had learned what to ask for from his own father. It is his father who taught him the wisdom. If the father was not there, if the father had not taught him the wisdom on what he needed to get most, more than anything else, when God came to visit Solomon, he would have missed out if the father was not there. And Solomon is, is the wise man we talk about today, who has written the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, not because of his own wisdom, but because of the wisdom that he was taught to him by his own father, David, when he was a son. And this is what I am going with this. That fathers are important. They speak wisdom into the lives of their children. They make children see the world in a different as it is, as a real world with flaws and failures, with both with both jokers and serious people. The fathers teach children the understanding, the wisdom. In fact, fathers do even more than that. Did you know that it has been proved that children not even sense authority in the mother's voice? Children sense authority in the voice of their father. That's why a mother can be telling the children, don't do this. And she keep raising the voice. She keep shouting, don't do this, don't do this. But the father just need to say it once. What are you talking about? And the whole thing is done. Because the father is the voice of authority, is the prophetic voice over the lives of children. So I want to challenge you a little fathers today that it means when you are quiet as a father, you are doing a lot of injustice over your children. You are doing a lot of injustice over your sons and daughters when you don't speak to them, when you don't speak over their lives, when you don't talk to them, when you don't teach them, when you don't instruct them, when you don't advise them, when you don't counsel them, when you don't teach them and train them, you are doing them a lot of injustice. There are things that only fathers can, can teach their children. Fathers are important too. They are important, but they are important in a different way. They are important too. The father's voice is what makes someone to be the person that they are. Made by the father's voice. Solomon was made by the voice of his father. You are the way you are today because there is a voice. Could be your biological father or your, or your spiritual father. It's because of the voice of a father that has made you or that makes you. To be the person that you are. Don't you let the enemy make you be quiet. And even when your children go the wrong direction. Because sometimes, especially a teenage, they might, try, like I said, they will try to test your philosophy and ideology about life. And to see how rigid and how stout and how solid you are grounded on your, on your philosophy. Even when they go haywire, you cannot afford not to speak. The father that we read about in the, in the book of Luke chapter 5, sorry, the story that I started with, about the man who had two sons. It was he who restored his wayward son. It was because of his voice. When he came back home, he was not reprimanded. They celebrated. They celebrated him. They reached, the father received his son. And I want you, even when you see your children go the wrong direction, Try to speak to them, to receive them, to bring them back home, to give them back their identity, to clothe their naked them, to give them wise counsel, and to show them the right direction. And therefore, and this is what I want to close with today, therefore, you cannot say, 
And I do not agree with the media, dramas and episodes that we see on movies and all kinds of dramatization, trying to, trying to depict men as weaklings, as uh, womanizers, people who are not responsible. And I, I disagree entirely with that. We have got men who have been faithful, who are honest, who are trustworthy, who are truthful, who are diligent, who, are, who, who love God, who fear God. We walk in submission. By the way, you cannot be a true father if you are not submitted to the father of all fathers, our heavenly father. You can only become a true father when you are submitted to the father of fathers. And by the way, the ultimate evolution of man is fatherhood. Fatherhood is what we men have been called to do. Fatherhood is what we have been called to do by God. To represent him as his voice on earth, in our families, in all the other places that God places us. He has positioned us there to represent him. And we better do this job with, with, with fear and trembling, knowing that one day we'll have to give an account telling God what we did with the position. Of all the titles that people have given me, and I have been given many titles, including uh, motivational speaker and, 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 and author, life coach, conference speaker, and all those things. I, the title I really cherish most of all of them, and I know I've said this before, is just Father. It, it's nothing that gives me joy and fulfillment like when I go home or when I'm at home and I call my children and they answer me and they say, Yes, Dad. Or they just call me, Dad. That to me is the, it, it's such a beautiful thing. To be a father. And I pray that God will help me. And I pray that God will help you. To be able to raise a generation of men and women who will come after us. Men and women who will love God. Will submit to God. That through us and through our children. There will be perpetuity of men who worship the true God. Who see God. Who fall on their face calling out on the name of the Lord. Who live right. Who preach righteousness. And who preach Christ. His power, the power of the blood, his resurrection, and his coming back again for his church. Now, if you have a father who is alive, I want you to do something for me. Really, it's not for me you are doing, but you are doing it for yourself. And I want you to do something for your father. It could be your biological father, but I'm talking mostly about biological fathers here. But if you don't have a biological father, it will be important that you look for a spiritual father. And you do this. I want to refer you to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. It's a scripture that we know so much. And I read it the day before Mother's Day. And I want to read it to you again. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 2. Honor thy father and mother. Which is the first commandment with a promise. Honor thy father and mother. I'm not talking about mother today. I spoke about mother on Mother's Day. But today I want to challenge you to honor your father. To honor your father. To, to honor means to highly regard. To highly esteem, to show respect, to praise, to adore, which means to love deeply. Honor your father. Look for your father. The father who raised you. Go to him if you can. If you're not restricted by the movement that we have. Go to him and let him know how grateful you are. Today I was having a session earlier in the morning at around 11 with a, a group of teenagers I normally do that on every Saturday. And most of the teenagers, funny enough, the most of the teenagers I had today were actually young men. Between the ages of 14 and around 20 there. They were all young men, except one. It was only one lady, actually. And I was telling them to go and make sure they go and they honor their father to, tomorrow. And I want to challenge you the same to, the, the, to do the same today. I want you to go and honor your father. Go do something wonderful for your father. If you can't go, send him a fat MPS uh, message. Let him smile. Let him call you and say, Hey, I have received some money. Nianini? Uh, Umetuma Yanini? Surprise him. Let, let, surprise him with something and just tell him, Dad, I just wanted to honor you. I just wanted to bless you because you are my father. And when he speaks the blessing, you may not understand why I say that I'm the way I am because of my father. Because I don't have the luxury of time to explain to you how my father laid his head on my head. And he spoke very powerful and wonderful things over my life. And it's because of the voice of my father that I am here today talking to you. And I want you to honor your father. Tomorrow, call him up. Buy her gift. 
doesn't have to be money. It could be something. If you can, I mean, if you can do something bigger than that, you can do that. Make your father feel comfortable, feel loved. By the way, did you know that men suffer in silence? Maybe you're wondering how, because you can't talk to me back. You're wondering how. Men suffer in silence because they hardly get people to tell them, I love you. We love you. In fact, even when we are told we love you, we are told as plural, we love you. People don't come openly the way we go to our mothers or people go to their mothers or to their children and say, I love you. For fathers, people hide. We, we, they don't want to stand singly and say, I love you. We suffer in silence because and let me tell you how it begins. When children are young, both boys and girls, as they grow, they are always told, I love you, I love you, I love you. When they are small, they are told that. But the moment they are approaching teenagehood, we continue the same, to say the same thing to the girl, but we stop saying that to the boy. So the boy gets, becomes an adult male. The girl, all the time she is told that by the mother or even the father. They are always told that, I love you. But for the boy, we stop. We stop telling the boy, I love you. We even find it strange, especially we African men, honestly. Let's be real. I also find it a little difficult to tell my son, my own son, I love you. So I try to use other words to say that. You know, being the African that we are, that I am proud of you. You know, when I say that to him, he understands that I'm talking about I love you. So we are deprived of that. We are never told that. So I want you to tell your father. How, he, he, he might behave awkward because he's not even used to hearing that anyway. He may, not, he may never even have told him that. But do it. Tell him that you love him tomorrow. Send him a gift. Buy a gift for him. You can do big things. You can buy for him a house. You, you can build for him a house. You can buy for him something that he has all along been desiring to, to do. And I, I thank God I, have been, I was able to do that for my father when he was alive. I was listening to the things he was desiring to do in life. And I made sure that he had them. And I did that for him. Because I used to hear him say, Mugwa kifugua jia. He used to talk like that. And then I would listen. And I thank God. So do something for your father. I have a little caution for the mothers who have been listening to me today. Who are perhaps raising children. Because they are, the father of the children ran away or is not there or is not even involved. And perhaps you feel bad. And in fact, you even carry resentment and bitterness towards the man who is the father of your own children. Now, regardless of what you are, the father of your children, because I don't know whether he still has, but or not, I don't know. I'm just assuming there's somebody perhaps listening to me today who is a mother, has children, and the father of the children is not there with the children at all. But if you're such a mother or you know such a mother, you need to encourage them and tell them this. This is very important for mothers. Mothers... Regardless of what the man did, that and I'm not trying to excuse what he did if he misbehaved, he did. But regardless of what he did, you cannot afford to speak ill of the father of your children to the same children. That would be very unwise. And I'm only trying to be so kind not to use the actual word. That would be very unwise for you to do. When you start talking ill of the father of your children and start insulting him, or they have, in fact, there could be mothers also who insult the, the father of the children in the house, the same home, husband and wife, but you insult the father because of something he has done or has failed to do. Then you start insulting and abusing him. When you do that, especially to the boy child, when you, when you abuse the father of a boy, you are already pointing your son to despise authority because the father is the authority. So when you start insulting, abusing him because of what he has done, because you are angry with him, you are already charting the course for your boy to take the wrong course in life, to disregard, despise authority. Because if a boy cannot own authority at home, he will never own authority anywhere else in the world. So I challenge you, and I tell you today, even if you're, he did what, don't you ever say ill of the father of your children in the presence of the children. Never do that. That will be unwise. And I'm avoiding to use the word that is the actual word there. I'm just trying to be nice. Just trying to be nice. So don't do that. And I hope that um, we will have fathers who will be celebrating tomorrow because they have been remembered. And I hope that there are some fathers who will be smiling perhaps for the first time in a long time because you have remembered them. 
And I want to say thank you so much for tuning in today. I took so much time. I thought I would take 15 or so minutes. Forgive me. I talk sometimes unknowing what I'm, I talk so many things. But thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate your keeping time with me this afternoon. And I want to add this live broadcast right there. But before I go, I want to pray. But before I pray, we have a session tonight for fathers on. This is for fathers. It's not for mothers. It is not for those. It's not for men who are not fathers. It is only for fathers. It's only for men who are fathers. Men who are fathers, we have a Zoom session tonight at 8 in the night. 8 to 9 o'clock. Just one hour. And I'll be speaking on 10 commandments of effective fatherhood. 10 commandments of effective fatherhood. So in case you want to be part of that, I think we have been having registration going on to the, during the day and in the course of the week. So if you want to be part of this, please, you can register before 8 o'clock and we will be happy to send you the link to join our meeting today. So thank you very much. Uh, please share this live broadcast to as many people as you can. You can create watch parties. Let people be blessed by this one. Allow me to pray before I let you go. Father, I thank you for giving me the grace and the strength to say what you put in my heart. And helping me to say the way I felt it in my heart and in my spirit. And I thank you for every man and woman that has listened to his word. May you bless them and help them to raise children in the ways that you want children raised. And I pray that the grace to renew that will be upon them. Bless the fathers who are struggling right now, who don't know where the next meal is going to come from. I pray that you, God, who is the father of fathers, may you make a way for a man who is a father and has no means of putting food for his family on the table. I pray that you make a way for him and provide for him to the glory and the praise of your name. I thank you for this session. Bless each one of us, those that are watching and those that will watch even after this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. See you next Saturday. Same time, same place. But remember, tonight, for fathers only. I'm talking to fathers today, especially fathers who are... Who, uh, who have children below the age, especially. That doesn't mean that if your children are above this, you cannot join. But I really want to speak to the young fathers especially. Fathers who have children below the ages of 10, I really would encourage you to join. But every other father is also welcome. God bless you. See you another time. Shalom. Peace.